The foundation stone was laid by former dictator Idi Amin. The country is Uganda, and the spectator's interest is focused on an unusual event in this troubled state. They're counting the votes in the first election for 18 years. In early December, Ugandans re-elected Dr. Milton Obote as their president. It was an exercise in democracy that Ugandans hope will bring stability. In Kampala, the capital, the daytime picture of normality is deceiving. When work ends, it's a desperate scramble to get a lift home, because there's still a curfew in operation. After dusk, Kampala is one of the most violent cities in the world. In one recent weekend, over 30 people died. The beaten and the battered are taken to Kampala's Mulago Hospital. But its medical facilities show the extent of Uganda's internal collapse. It's a legacy of eight years of brutal dictatorship under Idi Amin and 18 months of chaos since his overthrow. In greater part, it's still a luxuriant and bountiful land. But the values of Uganda's 13 million people have been distorted by the years of lawlessness. A whole new economy has developed based on the mahendo, the local term for black market. The basic monthly wage can be doubled by an hour's dealing in a scarce commodity like sugar. The breakdown in the country's communications has meant that imported goods like petrol are in short supply. Ugandans queue for hours for a few precious gallons. The country is barely ticking over. For all its potential wealth, Uganda can't get coffee, tea, sugar or minerals to the world markets. Against this background, the country's ruling military commission called for democratic elections. It was to be the first step towards political and economic stability. From the outset, the most favoured candidate was ex-president Dr Milton Obote. To fight the election, he returned after nearly ten years in exile in Tanzania. He had been overthrown while out of the country in 1971 by his army commander Idi Amin. Now he arrived to begin a remarkable comeback. His arrival was emotional and impressively orchestrated. The campaign of Obote's Uganda People's Congress, UPC, was to be well run and financed. Its strength came from the Nilotic peoples in the north and east of the country. Much of its cash is thought to have come from wealthy Asian families who were kicked out of Uganda by Amin. They hoped an Obote victory would allow them to return and repossess their land and businesses. A campaign of Asian hopes and tribal enthusiasm. The UPC campaigned hard. Dr Obote had a lot to live down. His method of ruling between 1962 and 1971 was increasingly resented by important groups of Ugandans. He earned the enmity of the three million Baganda by sending their chief ruler into exile. He then suspended the country's constitution and turned Uganda into a one-party state. According to his party's highly effective propaganda machine, Dr. Obote has been chastened by nearly a decade in exile. During this campaign, he preached reconciliation and reconstruction. His party's manifesto was moderate. This time, he promised to stick to the democratic process. The propaganda remained distrustful. Fists were waved at Obote's election cavalcade. They feared his return would lead once more to autocratic, military-backed government. The main opposing party to the UPC was led by Paul Semogerere. The conservative, Roman Catholic-dominated Democratic Party gained the overwhelming support of the Buganda. Semogerere, a quiet lawyer, seemed lacklustre in his performance against Obote. The DP was not as efficiently organised as the UPC. In his campaign, Samo Garari accused the UPC of intimidation. In the north, 17 UPC men had been elected unopposed. 
The DP claimed their candidates had been prevented from registering. The DP was clean, but they claimed the UPC was trying to win by fraud and intimidation. The role of the army was crucial. Believed to be behind a bote, it was also responsible for imposing law and order so Ugandans could vote peacefully. Given the accusations, we asked the army leader, Brigadier Ojek, whether he felt free and fair elections were possible. There are Commonwealth observers in Uganda today. You may as well ask them that question. But do you think there are 60 of them Commonwealth observers? Why don't you ask them? Well, do you think they'll be free and fair? I think so. Do you think there'll be no intimidation? No, I don't. Brigadier, <laughs> thank you. On election day, Ugandans turned out to vote in enormous numbers. Some of them had walked many miles to arrive at the polling stations early in the morning. For many, it was their first vote ever. Mr. Ebenezer Deborah led the Commonwealth Observer Team. Nine senior observers and their 37 assistants chatted to voters and watched over the polling. There was, however, a major hitch. Officials waited in vain for ballot papers. By midday, they still hadn't arrived at some Kampala polling stations. Some voters believed they weren't going to be allowed to vote. To exercise our liberty, our birth liberty. It was the early afternoon before the ballot papers finally arrived. Commonwealth observers were to note this and other irregularities. But overall, they were to overlook these problems and to declare the result of valid exercise. They felt that the Ugandan people had been freely able to express their choice. The use of dye, as in Zimbabwe, stopped voters voting more than once. Stamped ballot boxes were padlocked. The observers felt the country should accept the result. DP candidate got 900, 883. The votes had been counted with painstaking precision in the back rooms of polling stations up and down the country. Many results had been announced when the military commission stepped in, suspending all results, even arresting the returning officer in Kampala, who had issued his. During the night, Paul Mwanga, chairman of the military commission, and Dabote made endless calls around the country to check the results for themselves. Mwanga was not mincing his words. He said he would vet every result in every constituency himself in effect that the military commission would decide. They're old friends, Mwanga and Dabote, and they shared elation when they came to their verdict. That verdict was a narrow victory for Dabote. Everyone joined in, although the army commander, David Ojok, looked subdued. He fears trouble ahead. There's no champagne in Kampala, so it had to be sparkling wine. How could a vote possibly bring the country together now after an election like this? We have a very positive policy on the matters of healing the wounds of Uganda, the policy of reconciliation, the policy of no revenge. And if the losers accept democracy, I hope they will accept the result of the election. That night, heavy gunfire echoed around Kampala. It was believed a voter's mandate was being sealed in blood as factions of the Ugandan army turned on each other. Paul Samagarare had no way of knowing what was going on when I found him at his home early this morning. He was sticking to his claim of victory. Anything else would be fraud on Mwanga's part, he said. I think it's, under, it's acting under pressure. I would say the chairman, not the whole military commission, I think the chairman is probably acting under pressure from the UPC. From a boat, eh? It is possible. I wouldn't be so categorical, I'm not sure, but I believe uh, there is pressure from uh, what has come, either to keep the world ignorant of the defeat of the EPC, or worse still, to put pressure on him to nullify results which are in, in the field of the Democratic Party, and perhaps uh, come out with the defrauded election results, claiming a EPC victory. As word spread that the DP might not come to power, a crowd gathered outside Samagarare's headquarters in Kampala, chanting for the victory they do believe is theirs.
President Obote is back in the presidential palace, the first modern African president to regain office after being deposed. This power was reinforced by the Ugandan army and the 10,000 Tanzanian troops who remained in the country after overthrowing General Amin. But was Dr. Obote's victory legitimate? What about opposition claims of foul play? Uh, the UPC or the Democratic Party or any other party has evidence of, of uh, elections not having been done according to law. Uh, the provision is there in the law. We would go to the, to the, to the courts. We would not accept uh, even a UPC member sitting in parliament if he was not properly elected. We would not. You said time and again, Dr. Obote, that you want to clean up Uganda. Yes. How are you going to do that? <laughs> There's a lot of work to be done. We'll try to clean up Uganda. Uganda's stability will depend on several factors. One will be whether Obote can win the confidence of the Baganda. Another is law and order. Even more important, perhaps, is the economy, for if prosperity returns, stability will probably come with it. Obote has promised to tackle these problems without interfering with Uganda's newly restored democracy. Keeping that promise will make this one of the most difficult jobs in Africa.